we go. Boy Reviews! All right, welcome back to Born Reviews. Nick here, and I have a special kind of video. I'm trying to um, be innovative and trying to discover different avenues that might help on our channel, and this is going to be the first one of those types of avenues. I am going to be reviewing the book, Ready Player One, and comparing it to the movie, Ready Player One. These are two properties, or one property, in two formats, that are completely different. I was with a bunch of my friends not too long ago, a week ago, and we get together and we talk about movies. And so we kind of did it in a cool way where we did a social distancing conversation. We were out in a uh, in a parking lot, an empty parking lot, and we were spread out six feet. We had our lawn chairs, we had our own snacks, and we were just talking about movies. That's, that's, uh, that's how cool we are. <laughs> and Ready Player One got brought up, and I said, oh, yeah, I love that movie. I, I don't understand all the hatred for it. I absolutely loved it. And someone said, well, you got to read the book because the book is so different. And if you watch, read the book first and then watch the movie, it completely tarnishes it. And so I'm not a huge reader, but if you've been following me on Instagram, you know I started reading Ready Player One. I finished it within a few days. Absolutely love the book. I absolutely love the movie before that. Absolutely love the book. So I want to talk about those two things. First, let's talk about the book Ready Player One written by Ernest Cline. Ernest Cline, this is his first novel that he wrote. He's written other novels like Armada Sense. And this book is a nerd's paradise, is a geek's paradise. And even if you just like good novels, it's that kind of paradise too. This book, very quickly, it takes place in the future, 2045, I believe. And in this future, there is a video game. The most popular video game is called The Oasis. It's a virtual reality world that James Halliday, the billionaire of Gregorius Games, has invented. And in this virtual reality, people spend their entire lives in this thing, for crying out loud. Um, in the book, you don't see this in the movie, but in the book, they um, we have Wade Watts, our main character. He goes to online school where there's a planet called Ludus, which has all the different public schools on there. And you can, when you enroll for school, you can do in person or you can do online. He got bullied a lot in school, so he chose to go online school and he absolutely loved it. You know, people can say what they want, they can make fun of you while you're walking in the virtual locker or hallways, and you can just mute them and not have to listen to it. There's no fights, obviously, or altercations. The teachers have more control of keeping you in your seat where you can't get around and cause trouble, or if you say bad words, the system mutes you out. So he's at school. And he's become a huge, a huge fan of James Holiday. James Holiday started this Easter egg um, contest like you see in the movie. And so we have these people called Gunters who go and search for – they hunt for the eggs. They're trying to search for these Easter egg – for the Easter egg. Each Easter – the Easter egg has three clues, <laughs> three challenges, and three gates along with those challenges. And you have to pass the challenge. You have to pass the clue – um, the gate. And then sometimes there's a bonus thing before you can get your key and your gate attached to your name. They have a scoreboard that everyone can see. The contest has been going on for about five years, and no one has caught a single key yet. That part is similar in the movie, but I'm telling you, these things are so different. The book is so fantastic because it dives deep into characters. That's what books are allowed to do way better than movies can. We get to know about Parsifal. We get to know about Artemis. We get to know about H. We get to know about Shoto and Dido. We get to know about Nolan Sorrento. Not as much, really. I think the movie may go more in depth with him than the book does. We get to learn about Wade's situation, what happened to his parents, why him and his aunt don't get along too well, why um, he's not loving life too much, his real level of poverty that this guy's in. You get to know all of this stuff. And I really like the way the book told the story. I, I loved it, actually. We had the first seven or eight chapters before we get into that first challenge that he gets an idea about, and that was a perfect amount. Maybe it was nine or ten chapters. It was a good amount of time for us to build, for us to understand these characters. And when I'm reading a book, if I can't put it down, if I'm reading 100, 200 pages a day, that means I'm absolutely loving it because my attention is so many different places, watching movies, doing reviews, talking to friends, talking to my family, watching all this other kind of stuff. It's hard for me to put that kind of attention on something like that, but that's what I was doing because this book is so engaging. This book for families out there, it has some language. It has some F-bombs in it, but it's not too prevalent. If you're used to skipping over those in books you're reading, then you'll be able to do that no problem in this book. In this book, we have the challenges in the book. Well, I'll get to that in a second. Other things I liked about this book is I like the story that, it followed, that we follow with Wade. 
I love his story arc. I like that character. I like how it gave us details on all the different shows he was watching. He was mentioning different songs that he was listening to or songs that were related to this or that when he was doing his gunting. And I would stop reading and I look up the song on my phone and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I haven't heard that before. Yes, I recognize that. And I would listen to it. I was reading the book. That was really cool. The book is, is fantastic. It really is. It's a, it's a fantastic book. I think it appeals to wide on, audiences. That's why it was so popular when it came out. I'm so glad I was able to discover it much later. I think it came out in 2011 when it was published. I'm so glad to be able to discover it nine years later and be immersed in this world and just really, really love it. Now the movie. So I love the movie, like I said beforehand. Going into it, it was my first exposure to it. I thought it was such a cool idea. I thought it was awesome that they had all these movie references, Back to the Future, and um, man, so many others I can't think from the top of my head. We see different characters in the fights, like we see the Ninja Turtles, we see the Battletoads, we see, I think, Katana, we see a lot of Street Fighter characters, we see Artemis do the Awuken at the end, or not Artemis, but Percival do the Awuken at the, Awuken at the end. There's so much in here that was easy for me to process. The whole Chucky sequence was awesome. The big, huge uh, Mega Go Godzilla was fantastic. And the RX-78 Gundam was fantastic. So many different things in the movie that I was like, this is fun. The music was great. The challenges were fantastic. The car ride and the first challenge. The shine. I love the shine. Another thing I came in late to in my life and absolutely love. So that was a really cool sequence. And I also love the last challenge with um, going through with all the heightened stakes and playing that adventure game. I knew nothing about it. I did not grow up on Atari, so it was cool to watch this movie and learn about a lot of these Atari games and the first Easter egg. I really liked the movie a lot. I thought Steven Spielberg brought us a very well-made movie. My biggest complaint about it is the actor that plays Wade Watts. I think he doesn't play him right. I think he is not the he doesn't show his best acting skills. He's much better at Cyclops in the X-Men movies, even though those movies aren't that great. I don't like his portrayal of Wade Watts in this movie. He's my, my biggest complaint. And on the flip side, um, the, the actress that played Sam Samantha Cook, Artemis, she did a fantastic job. Very, very likable. Very easy to get behind her. And it made me like her character in the book even more. Now is the comparison time. Now we're going to compare the two things because they are so different. I'm, gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to go item by item. I'm not going to go Easter egg by Easter egg or reference by reference because I just don't have that kind of knowledge base. I'm not going to do that. I want to go over the differences in the book and the movie. If you've not read the book, if you've not seen the movie, spoilers right now. This is going to be massive spoilers. If you don't care, stick around and let's listen to some of these differences. So first of all, in the movie, we have Artemis, Sam Cook, the girl that gets taken by IOI and they, they trap her into there as one of their sixers and she is just stuck with them. That doesn't happen in the book at all. What happens in the book is Wade Watts, and this is one of my favorite parts of the book. Wade Watts, he falls in love with Artemis like we see in the movie, but it's way more drawn out as you would imagine in the book. And he gets to the point where he gets too close. He tells her, I love her. I love you. She gets scared because, again, these are people you don't know who they are. You don't really know online what you're dealing with for the most part. And so she freaks out, and he goes into a deep depression. And for most of, most of the book, he's overweight. He loses the weight. He's exercising. He's paid for his rent after he got the first key and the first gate. He got a whole lot of money. He used that to move out of the stacks because, like in the movie, IOI attacked his stacks house and blew up his aunt and everyone else there. And so he was afraid. Why he, cho why he chose to go to Columbus where IOI station at is beyond me. But he does mention in there that he wants to get closer to that kind of internet connection and that kind of situation and then later on it fits perfectly but anyways he has this plan because at the end of and i'm jumping all over the place but at the end of the book when we have the the third challenge like in the movie they have that orb orb of office Osavux, that is protecting castle on and you can't get through it. They tried in the books, they explain how they try nukes and they try weapons, they try all types of bombs to bring that down. You're not going to scratch it. But in the book, they describe, I'm pretty sure that someone's touching the orb the entire time. And as long as someone's touching it, then it won't go down. So Wade decides, I, I got nothing else to lose. I've got no more friends. I've ruined it with Artemis. I'm going to get back at IOI. And they're really close to getting that third challenge, anyways. And they're protecting the castle so no one else can get in there. So he has his plan, and I love his plan. He's the one that gets arrested as an indentured servant to IOI. He racks up this debt, gets arrested, 
in the situation is an indentured servant. It's part of the law that they allowed in this book that if you're an indentured servant, you have to work for them until you pay off the debt. But they raise your interest or your debt so much that you'll never get out of there. You're just always working for them for free. They give you a tiny little like coffin-sized cubicle as your home that you sleep in. So he gets himself as an indentured servant, and he is uh, he did it on purpose. He's able to get into their intranet. He's able to get on a floppy disk he's a, or a flash drive, excuse me. He's able to find out that they are going to go after all his friends. So the whole plan of what Wade does in IOI is one of the favorite parts of the books. I'm not going to go too into, too deep into detail because I know I mentioned spoilers, but I still don't want to spoil too much. I love that whole thing. In the movie, we have it as Artemis that gets captured, and, and I understand why. I really do. For the story that, that portrayed in the movie, I understand why they chose, Ar Char chose Artemis. But I loved what Wade Watts did in the book. So that's one of the biggest differences, who gets arrested. Another huge difference is how the high five works. In the movie, they work together pretty much from the beginning. And they're a big team. And kumbaya, and we're going to get these things together. We're going to figure it out. In the book, it's not that way. It's a big competition. They, um, they meet a few times. And H and Parsifal are best friends. But when it comes to hunting, they even say, he even says in the book that I'm not going to help him. He's not going to help me. Now, they do a little bit. For the first one, but it, they're, it's every man for themselves, and they all want this prize. They all have different reasons for why they want to to win the grand prize of the half trillion dollars for crying out loud and control the oasis. And it's just a, it's a challenge. It's a hunt, and I liked that. I liked how they would help themselves each other a little bit, but for the most part, it was a competition. I love competition, so I liked that aspect more in the book. That was way different than in the movie. He does not really get to know Shoto or Dido too much in the book until about halfway through, and it seems like they're best friends. Shoto and Dido, let's talk about those characters. Way different in the book and movie. In the movie, 11-year-old kid and his older brother. In the book, they're not really brothers. They just got really close online, never met in person. They were both grown men. None of them, none of them were an 11-year-old kid. So that was really interesting. In the movie, or in the book, excuse me, one of them dies. I won't say who, but one of them dies by Awe breaking into their apartment and throwing over the balcony when they're trying to get one of the keys. It's jacked up. In the movie, you have Nolan Sorrento at the end trying to shoot them in the van. That doesn't happen in the book. He gets arrested by the government, by the federal agents before that even happens because Wade Watts has sent proof that he had downloaded from the intranet to show that they had all these files and that they had sent people to kill Wade Watts's um, stack house and the Dido or Shido to kill him. So they had that proof that got arrested before any of that stuff happened. The girl in the movie who helps Nolan Sorrento does not exist in the book whatsoever. In the book, you go more in depth on the gear and the evolution of the Oasis, which was really cool. Ogden Morrow is different in both these books. It's the same name. In the, in the book, we learn about how he has his character that is all powerful and cannot be killed, immortal, and he helps out the High Five. We find out near the end in certain ways. Now, yes, he helps out as a curator in the movie, but that curator character does not exist at all. The journals. In the movie, we have this whole library of journals where you go in and it talks about how every moment of his life has been recorded somehow by magical CCT, CCTV cameras or personal... This, That'd be impossible. And so you're able to go in there and look at all the history just by watching the video. And I thought it was really cool in the movie that they did that, but that does not exist in the in the book. In the book, simply, there's a journal called an almanac that was created by Anorak, or, which is James Holiday's avatar. And he dialogued all this stuff and kept track of all this stuff. And it's super thick, like a freaking dictionary or something. And so the Gunters would study that and read that and try to find any clues in there. It wasn't a physical place they would go to. There's so many there's so many different oh the challenges. Challenges in both were completely different. Not one of the challenges in the movie happened in the book. And the only thing that was closest to it was adventure was involved in both ways, but not in the way it showed in the movie where they're all the sixers are trying to figure it out and they keep dying and keep dying until they figure it out. It's a challenge after the gate, that bonus challenge where you have to earn your stripes, so to speak. They had these really cool things in the book for these challenges where you had to act out a movie, one of Halliday's favorite movies, First War Games and then Monty Python, Holy Grail. And so you had to know those movies memorized 
one main characters, their dialogue, and you had to act it out. And then I think when he did the Holy Grail one, he had to do everyone's who was in that scene, the main person's dialogue. So you had to have it memorized. And if you didn't have enough memorized, you were kicked out. You lost some points before you were kicked out. If you had so many lines in a row, like seven in a row, you got these cue card bonuses and you were able to, it's like a freebie if I forget a line. So that was really cool. I would have loved to see that in the movie. I would love to play that game. I love movies so much. Can you imagine acting out your own movies and trying to get points for how many dialogue words you have memorized? That'd be so cool. I All the challenges were different. One of the challenges, I think the second one, you got at the end of the gate, you got um, you played Black Tiger. You got a, a huge robot as a prize. That was really cool. That's how Sorrento gets his Mega Godzilla. And then everybody gets their own giant robot. It's H, I'm pretty sure, that takes the Gundam, not Dido. Or sh yeah, Dido. He has a different robot. In the book, you some of these guys like Artemis and Parsifal, they get their own planets for crying out loud. And Parsifal calls it Falco, and it's his, his own hideout where he has these different vehicles he's collected and he uses those vehicles to transport. It's just, it's so cool and it's so elaborate in the book. There's just vast differences. The biggest one are those challenges. And I'm wondering with Ernest Klein writing the screenplay for the movie and writing the book, I wonder why he made him so different. It makes me think that the producers, the studio, whoever it was, maybe the directors said the challenges in the book are great, but they're just not meant for film. We need something more grand, more um, nice to look at, more colorful, more music-y. So how can we make that happen? So as much as I love those challenges in the movie, it was just a point that they were way different than in the book, and I would love to see the war games or the Monty Python type thing. That would have been really cool. There was just so many references that I did not know, but I still appreciate it because of – Ernest Klein's obvious obsession with all these things. I feel like in a lot of ways he's Halliday and he mentions these things because he loved them. Even obscure bands I've never heard about before playing songs at the club or whatever they're dancing at. There's just so much. I, I love them both. The movie, <laughs> after reading the book, the movie I've got to give a B minus. It's very entertaining, but there's just some parts that it missed as far as potential. The book, as a book, I'm going to give it – I'm going to give it a different kind of scale since the book. I'm going to give the book a 92 out of 100, and that is based on entertainment value, readability, rereadability, interesting characters, the way the story goes, understanding it. It gets a 92. It's not a perfect 100, but 92 is very high. The book is much better than the movie. I like them both still. I just watched the movie after I read the book, and I'm like, man, there's just so much differences. It just goes super fast, but there was still some cool stuff in there. That's my comparison of Ready Player One, the book versus the movie. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you want me to do more of these type of things when comparison to, comparing two things, whether it's a book and the movie or two things in a different format. Let me know your thoughts in the comment below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, adios.